So I uh, greatly appreciate this uh, opportunity to uh, talk uh, today. It's going to be about my book that just came out, which is on Hayek. A large part of that uh, book is a love story, actually, to the Mercatus Center and its evolution. The book is actually dedicated to three of the founding faculty members um, in that. And that relationship continues, you know, and I want to thank Dan Rothschild for his leadership, as well as Tyler Cowan, who's who's not here because he's buzzing around the world changing it, and I'm just studying it. Um, but um, so, and for the, the, the students from American, uh, thank you, and thank you, Siri, for bringing them over. Um, if you have any questions as I go through this, because some of this is kind of a little insider baseball stuff, but just stop and raise questions, because it has a lot to do. The fundamental insights in the book are about how we understand an entrepreneurial society, how we understand the institutional preconditions to a society, an entrepreneurial society, which leads to human flourishing, and what the promise of that is for the future. So that's kind of the goal that it ends up with. The last part of the book is all about that. Uh, but it, it takes you through the, through the study of Hayek's evolution of his ideas and the debates that he was involved in and so that might be a little too thick in the woods at times. So just feel free to stop me as I go along, and I'll try to clarify questions about that. But, um, but anyway, for, for the rest of you <laughs> that are here, um, Hayek's research program and its evolution of its research program had, of course, a huge influence on Baldy Harper and everyone else that, you know, did. so I'm thrilled to be able to to talk to you about that. Um, Hayek, in many ways, is the quintessential representative of what IHS is all about. Um, the Institute for Humane Studies, for those of you who don't know that, they're borrowing from the, the French liberal school. It's the science is humanist, right? It has nothing to, you know, used to run around with t-shirts that said humane on it, and it had nothing to do with the humane society. Um, and uh, I also heard one someone you know, give a talk and said, oh, no, we're in favor of the humane society, which, by the way, is true, but that's not at all what IHS was about. IHS is about this interdisciplinary approach, which was the link between the moral sciences and uh, economy. Is that me? No, somebody. Oh, OK. Should I be nervous? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Either that or NSA. I don't know. Um, but it, you know, if you're looking, hi. Anyway, um, so the science is humanist is uh, was the French liberals, and they had the journal des Economies um, that was founded around that. That's John Baptiste de Say all the way up through Frederick Bastiat. Um, and they, they, they believed in this interdisciplinary idea. That, that school of thought had a huge influence on Tocqueville. And in fact, when Tocqueville was making the voyage to come from Europe to the United States, the book that he was reading was John Baptiste de Say's Treatise of Political Economy. And the Treatise of Political Economy is the first book actually used to teach political economy in the United States at Thomas Jefferson's uh, University um, in Charlottesville. Um, as you know, if you know anything about Jefferson, is he was a Francophile, loved the French, and so he was tied into all of that. So this is what Baldy Harper was reaching back to to try to explain to have a institute for hum for advanced study in the uh, the social sciences and the humanities. And Hayek is a quintessential scholar of that, and it's embedded in his works like the Constitution of Liberty, Law, Legislation, and Liberty. Um, as, uh, as well as even in The Road to Serfdom, which a lot of people misunderstand because they think of the book as a popular policy book, but if you read it, it's actually a very deep uh, thinking book. Anyway, so that's the cover of the book. It's not exciting. Uh, it's in a series called Great Thinkers in Economics, so it was a great opportunity for me. If you look up, it's, it's a library book, so that means it's expensive. So don't annoy, get annoyed with the authors on the expensive books. These are library binding books. But the business model is kind of interesting nowadays because if you belong to a library that has a connection to their journals, you can get the book for free as a PDF. 
okay, which all of your uh, AU and GMU has this. But you can also get a paperback for $25 called My Copy. You just got to follow the links. Um, but if you just want to go to Amazon and buy the hardback, you're going to you know, be screwed. Um, so I don't recommend that. Uh, but, uh, but the series itself is actually quite impressive. It covers from Adam Smith all the way up to the most recent one is James Mead and uh, Tobin and you know, all the, the everyone in between, including Hayek. And I got the opportunity to do this, so I was thrilled to do it. Um, what I try to do in the book is explain, uh, I'm, not, I'm not, so when I sat down and you get invited to write something like this, you sit down, you do a stock taking. This is how your professors work, okay? They, you know, write their articles, which no one tells them to write, and they just think, what's, what's my curiosity driving me toward? And they do a whole bunch of things like that. So I've been writing pieces on Hayek and the debates Hayek's been involved in since I was a little bit older than you guys, starting actually when I was an undergraduate. And, um, and so, you know, 30 years later, they say, oh, this guy wrote a lot about Hayek, so they give you the opportunity. Then I sit down and I try to do like, like you would do if you were doing any kind of entrepreneurial venture, right? You kind of look at the market competition and where's my unique thing going to LA? And so, you know, I'm not, I, don't, I didn't set out to write the definitive intellectual biography of Hayek. That's being done by a guy named Bruce Caldwell. He is the editor of the Collected Works of Hayek. He runs the Center for History of Political Economy at Duke. Um, he's doing that. I didn't sit down to try to write a short summary of Hayek's ideas. That's done by my colleague, Don Boudreau, in a book called The Essential Hayek. It's easily available. It's a great book. I didn't try to write a scandalous book you know, about Hayek's personal life and all that. And Lanny Ebenstein did that. Uh, it's very important uh, that you know to Hayek's own story and all this. So what I try to do is like, okay, so I'm not really writing an intellectual biography of Hayek. I'm going to write an argument about what Hayek's ideas speak to us today. So that's why I said the thing about the entrepreneurial society. I'm trying to see what in the evolution of Hayek's ideas still speak to us in the social sciences and humanities today for the way that we try to practice economics. So in many ways, the book is written to you guys three years from now. And people like Siri, like 10 years ago, oh, right? So <laughs> 10 years ago, three years ago, like that's the sweet spot for the book. Because what I'm trying to do is get young people to think about, OK, excited about economic ideas, and then what kind of economist do you want to be when you do work with those kind of ideas? And, 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 and where do you see the value of that? So this is the evolutionary potential for Hayek's ideas. It's the continual uh, evolution. One of the things I think why Hayek is an interesting and attractive figure is precisely because Hayek was a lifelong learner. And I, and I want to communicate that goal to anyone who's reading the book, is that what scholarship is really about is not coming up with one grand idea when you're 20 and then running with it until you're 90. Right? That, that's, there's something to value of that. That's called persistence, grit, you know, other kinds of things. And you can value that. But that's not the evolutionary potential of ideas. The reason why Hayek is interesting is because he constantly was learning and adapting and adjusting. So if you think about it in a boxer metaphor, Hayek is like Sugar Ray Leonard, not George Foreman. All right, he's bobbing, he's weaving, he's dancing, or Muhammad Ali, better yet, but right, not not George Foreman, who's just like you know moving slowly and plodding and everything like that, and then punching you, or Mike Tyson, right, which is like a blunt force instrument rather than a fine art. Hayek is constantly evolving and adjusting, and so thus we're asking throughout the 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 uh, the, the whole book project two like fundamental questions. One of them is, does the past have a useful economics? And does economics have a useful past? And I want to find the Venn diagram that overlaps that. All right, So it's the interplay between circumstances and ideas which give rise to these debates, which then what can we take from those which are not tied to that time, but resonates through time. Okay. So, and, and Hayek is a perfect person to do this for two reasons. One, he lived a long time. 
So he was born in the 19th century and dies at the end of the 20th century. So the whole 20th century is Hayek century. And he wrote articles starting in the 1920s, and his last book was published in 1980s. So that's a long time to be writing things, OK? All right, that's one thing. Second of all, his career follows the quintessential Jungian archetype. OK, what do I mean by that? He has a meteoric rise to fame, a crashing defeat, and then a resurrection. Ever hear that story, by the way? OK. Now, <laughs> if you hear that story, no matter who it is, it sells. The person becomes famous. This is Sylvia Nassar's reason why, you know, so here I am as a, these guys are too young for this, but all of you will get this. I'm teaching at New York University, and uh, I can talk to people. Most of my colleagues can't really talk to people all that well. So Sylvia Nassar was a former student at NYU who then became the editor, economics editor at the New York Times. And so she used to want to talk to people at NYU about what was going on in her column, you know, the economic point of view, which was the New York Times column. And it, I started talking to her because Greg Mankiw signed a million dollar contract to write his principles book. And this was like big news in the economics profession. And I was one of the referees on Mankiw's book in the original one. So she came and talked to me. Anyway, we became friends. And so then she sits down with me one day. We're having coffee at the Violet, which is a coffee shop around NYU. And she says, did you read my column on Sunday? It was the week after the Nobel Prize. And the Nobel Prize that year had gone to John Nash. And she wrote a column about John Nash and his meteoric rise, his crashing defeat, and then his resurrection to win the Nobel Prize. And I said, in typical Pete fashion, ah, <laughs> Nash never should have won. Should have been shelling. Why, why the hell do we give it to Nash? He's just a crazy person. Now, I should give you some background. When I wrote my second book, I wrote it in the Princeton Library. That's where I wrote it, OK? And if you watch the film, Beautiful Mind, I'll come back to that in a second, so, uh, John Nash is there drawing formulas on the windows. He actually did do that. That's not a made up thing. I saw him do it. And I actually had conversations with him because he actually thought a lot of his ideas related to Hayek's. But when you talk to him, he only stared at his feet. And he usually kind of like turned his back to you. It's like, yeah, my ideas are into Hayek or whatever. And so you're like, OK, he's kind of crazy. And uh, so you know, I was a little nervous talking to him. But so he wins this Nobel Prize. I tell Sylvie, I said, oh, no one's going to read that. And she goes, oh, I'm going to write a book about him. I go, come on now. No one, write a book about Hayek at least. You know, don't write a book about Nash. And so when The Beautiful Mind came out, which, by the way, became a bestseller and then a movie and won an Oscar and blah, 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 she sent me a copy of her book and uh, <laughs> you know, tried to tell me that uh, you know, I was a great predictor of success in academics. But uh, Hayek's arc of his career, combined with the debates that he's involved in, make him a very, very fascinating character. And so this is, uh, can everyone read this up here? This is, I don't know how well that's communicating. Um, but uh, this is the title here, is The Quest for Exact Thinking in Demented Times. I think the young people, this is very important to get across because um, the 20th century is a paradox. It's full of various different paradoxes. And th this is the quote, is the, uh, there's a, this is a name of a book by a mathematician at the University of Vienna named Carl Sigmund. He wrote a book called Exact Thinking in Demented Times in which he's trying to explain the philosophy of science and of mathematics and everything that emerged in Vienna during this period of time. Now, you know, you don't think about Vienna, but if you study or read anything about it, Vienna was a cradle of civilization at the turn of the century. Fin de Sickle Vienna was the great flourishing of arts, of music, of science, of philosophy, and a lot of all the great ideas trace back to Vienna at that period of time. There's a great book by the literary figure Steven Zwig called The World of Yesterday, which uh, captures this beautiful world that then gets torn asunder. So all that was solid melts into air, right? And, and the, it ultimately leads to, of course, you know, uh, the Nazis you know, coming in and destroying their civilization. You get little glimpses of it if you see something like uh, 
that movie that Helen Mirren was on about the, 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 the woman in gold, right? The painting of the woman in gold. That's, so you can see a little bit of it in your movie cultures, but it's not something to read about. But it was a really horrific thing. This guy, Steven Zwig, after he wrote this book, he committed suicide, right? Because his whole world was, you know, in, in solid. It all gets ripped apart. He, you know, writes about it, and then, you know, he's depressed, and the world's falling apart. And so part of the reason why I have this is because a theme in the book is that uh, the Vienna Circle was one way in which we tried to answer the exact thinking in, or the quest for exact thinking in demented times. But Hayek is another one. So Hayek gives an alternative answer to that. And this is, so over here is the number of deaths uh, due to uh, the uh, uh, various events that Hayek was living through while he was becoming an economist and social thinker. And so this is World War I, which Hayek served in. Then you have the number of deaths in World War II. You have the deaths associated with Soviet communism, and you have the deaths associated. These are not deaths just people just died because they got to be like 80 or something, right? It's deaths that they were actually exterminated by their state. So this is death by the government caused by the government. These are the casualties of these systems. This is all going on. So think about Hayek. He's living through World War I, the Depression, World War II, and then the Cold War. That's the historical background against which he's going to engage in these debates with people about what? About things like socialism versus capitalism, about the Great Depression, the causes and consequences of the manipulation of money and credit, what's the best response to that, um, and these things. And what Hayek argues is that the 20th century got confused. So you have this, come up with this answer to it, and what it does is it's like looking through the world through a prism, and they've twisted the prism, and you have a distorted image of the world. And the cause of that distorted image of the world and of the nature of economics and the social sciences and what those can deliver for you, that's a consequence of the fact that there was this alliance between statism and scientism. The idea that the only way that you can do science is to mimic the, uh, the natural sciences and that the whole purpose of the sciences was to transform the, these sciences humanus from a science of social understanding to a science of social control. Everything was supposed to be under the direction of the engineer. And we're going to translate society into that and, and move that way. And what Hayek argues in his Nobel Prize address is that this confusion led us to a situation where social scientists turned, were turned into potential tyrants over their fellow citizens and destroyers of the very civilization that they're trying to uh, understand and maintain. And so this is uh, Hayek's response to these things um, in these debates. So what do I try to do in Hayek's arc of his career that's a picture, by the way, of Hayek teaching. Hayek, by the way, was a terrible teacher. Uh, like a lot of, he wasn't a terrible teacher just because he was like terrible. He was a terrible teacher because he actually uh, was really not, didn't understand English all that well. Uh, so what he was a great teacher of is graduate students. So graduate students flocked to his and Robin's seminar, but the students that he had, like for regular classes, they didn't understand what he was talking about. But by the way, that's not unusual for immigrant you know, people that moved. Uh, Abba Lerner, who's one of Hayek's students, he had a job at Michigan State, and it's famous because he always used as an example, he first went to New York, and then he went to Michigan State. And then when he was in Michigan State, he was trying to talk about complements and substitutes, and he used the examples of bagels and locks. And the kids in Lansing, Michigan, had no idea what a bagel was. And they didn't know, like, is there locks on something like that? And so he didn't understand that they didn't understand. And so it took a whole semester to figure it out. Um, <clears throat> so, but uh, actually, this is a very, this is not, uh, Rosalino Candela is in the back room. Raise your hand, Rosalino. Rosalino and I are uh, co-authors on a lot of projects and uh, co-partners in research. Uh, on these things, and we just did a paper on the London School of Economics, which is a very pivotal aspect in the history of 20th century economics. And one of the key things there is Lionel Robbins, who was kind of the force there, he really wanted to have Mises 
be the professor that came to the London School of Economics. But he couldn't get Mises to come because Mises was even worse at English than Hayek. So Hayek was the default option uh, because Mises was really terrible at English. And that's a very important thing to understand. Uh, you know, uh, Nigel would be able to talk to you about this as well, is that you know, when works get translated into the language that they want to be in, like, so Hayek is the one who, and Robbins are the ones who introduce Mises' ideas to English-speaking world. Because none of Mises' stuff is available in English until they bring it out. And this is a very uh, fascinating part of the, universe, uh, of, uh, of the London School of Economics, because what Robbins and Hayek see themselves as doing is actually bringing Mises' ideas to the English-speaking world. And they're very explicit. It's not like something that's like can be divined only what it, it's like right there in black and white in their letters to one, you know, to one another about what they're trying to do. And, uh, and they're responsible. Robbins is responsible for not only bringing theory of money and credit out, but that doesn't come out until five years after Hayek is already at the London School of Economics. Same thing with Mises' famous article on economic calculation or socialism. These are already, Hayek had already been the person communicating those ideas. So it makes it kind of interesting because it's like, how do you go through all that? Anyway, Hayek's career, I argue, in here, besides this arc, can be summarized by four different unique research segments. Now, I should point out that, like in anything, these all blur into one another. So I'm artificially imposing like a research emphasis on them because they all flow in. In fact, part of the story is to see how they all interconnect, that there's a coherence between them. But his emphasis is, uh, so those are going to start out as economics as a coordination problem, which is roughly from 1922 until around 1945 or so. Uh, the Abuse of Reason Project, which is, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. That's uh, from 1940 to roughly around 1960. Then the restatement of liberal principles of justice is basically 1960 to 1980. And then 1980 is this last part, and Hayek dies in 1992. And so I don't talk that much about this last part in here. Um, but that is definitely, he returns at the end of his career to basically philosophical anthropology and the study of man. And what does it mean, the fact that our evolutionary past, like when we move from uh, our pre-human existence into human beings, what does that tell us about the nature of the way we cooperate? Uh, you know, how does that tell us about the mores that we come to believe in and whatnot? Tradition. He wants to study tradition in that sense. But these first three periods sort of take up the, the bulk of the book. And I spent a lot of time on this first one because my argument is, is that's the first one and his answer of that which drives all the way through to the other ones. So the, the easiest way to understand, I think, or get a coherent picture of what Hayek was trying to do and therefore get Hayekianism is to look at his frustrations, right? Because like all intellectuals, he thought he had a winning argument. Like, OK, I won that argument. And then people are like, no, you didn't win. And he's like, oh, well, why? Like, obviously, I won. Like, what's your problem? What's your damage? I'm, I'm, giving Hayek New Jersey now. Um, and, uh, and, then there, and so then Hayek's like, oh, well, that must be your damage, right? And I have to adjust. Now I have to fight that argument. But it's not like he goes back and says, oh, like I was wrong about the problem of imputation. So just very simply, economics is a coordination problem. Here's the fundamental problem, all right? Someone right now is trying to raise pigs all right, so chickens. Someone's trying to raise chickens for your food that you just ate. By the way, there was lamb out there, so you failed on that job. But anyway, uh, to my benefit, because I like the lamb. But so someone right now is trying to raise chickens, and they're investing in all these chickens and everything like that, right? And they're trying to figure out what the economizing thing is to do the profit maximizing strategy. But those chickens aren't going to be sold in the market until two years or three years from now. So how do I coordinate that I understand how to raise chickens, invest in a chicken farm, do all that stuff, and pay my workers that are working at a chicken farm, though I'm not going to sell the chickens until three years from now? How am I going to pull that off? Right? That's the coordination problem. Because imagine if I just had like too many chickens, 
And then I try to sell them in the market later on. And of course, you know, that's a supply shock. The price is down. I can't then justify it. So that's not good. How about if I don't raise enough chickens? Now, you know, people all want these chickens over here and there's not enough of them in the market, right? And so I have to somehow coordinate that. Now, what, what does that for us? So all of you guys are studying entrepreneurship. So one of the things you learn about is ROI, return on your investment, right? You know, one of the great foundations of, by the way, this is an apocryphal story. I don't know if it's true, but I know the location. And one of, one of the greatest inventions of all of mankind is double entry bookkeeping. And double entry bookkeeping emerged in the Mediterranean. That's where it first started. And the reason why it started there was because husbands would go fishing. Right? Now, what did, you know, you, you guys have significant others. What do your others do when they go out and do things like fishing? They like lock around, you know, like this, and they drink, and they have like that, and then you have someone at home, and they got like all the kids, and they're taking care of the house, and all these things like that, and they got to figure out whether or not the deadbeat husband who's going out to fish is bringing in enough resources to justify him going out to fish rather than do some other occupation. Well, lo and behold, we have double entry bookkeeping, which is, you know, I have these outlays, and I have these receipts. Do they line up? Okay, you can keep going fishing. Right? But if all of a sudden they can't, hey, Dumbo, like I got Junior here to feed, you know? So like worry about Junior over here, right? I got to feed him, right? And so double entry bookkeeping is this major thing. We're all doing it all the time. In a modern advanced economy, this is called what? Right? Your interest rate, your present value calculation. So here's a good exercise for all of you. Write down a present value calculation. Right? Just write it down. Write down the formula. Learn how to do it. And then step back for a minute and then think to yourself, what are all the background institutions that are required for me to even make that simple present value calculation? So here's the first one, that when you get the receipts, no one's allowed to hit you over the head and take them from you. Right? So like, how much would you invest if like, you, know, you invested in your chickens, and then when you brought them to market, someone just said, hit you in the head with a club and took your chickens, right? You wouldn't invest in that many chickens, right? So that's the first thing is we have to respect property and persons. How do we do that? That's the institutions you have to do, right? How about other ones? How about if, the, since I'm doing interest rates and I have to calculate, I have to worry about the monetary unit and whether or not the monetary union is going like this or if it's going like this. Right? It's easier for me to engage in my calculations. The monetary unit is, is stable rather than fluctuating all over the place. All right, so these are all the kind of things that Hayek was trying to get us to understand in the pure theory of how prices guide production and exchange behavior. And that became his emphasis. And distortions like the depression are when the price signals actually mislead people. And you end up by investing too much in one area and not enough in another area. So it's called mal-coordination or mal-investment. And that was his explanation for the reason why we had the Great Depression. Right? And that one, the one thing that was common among all exchanges right, is money. Money is one half of all exchanges. So, Hayek saw, so money buys goods and goods buy money. In a modern economy, goods don't buy goods. So money is one half of all exchanges in the economy. So if you manipulate the monetary unit, you're going to manipulate all the exchanges in the economy. And that leads to these distortions. And those distortions have to then be corrected. And so that's why you get a boom and a bust cycle. And that's what they mean by like the business cycle. And that was Hayek's basic story. And the Great Depression was an example of a boom and then led to a bust. And then a whole bunch of other things that made the severity of the bust last longer than what it needed to. And so he was trying to counter that in his, in his debates at this time. These are all his arguments that are going on. At the very end of this period, see, capitalism had become discredited because of the Great Depression. All right? So Hayek is trying to talk about, not capitalism. Hayek is not a defender of capitalism. He's a defender of the market system and the operation of the market system. To defend the capitalist system or whatever requires a whole bunch of other moral assessments that you might make. But capitalism had been delegitimized by the Great Depression. 
just to put things again in context, in the, in the UK where Hayek was teaching, unemployment rate went below 10% between 1920 and 1936, only one year, only one year. So we're in a period of very strong stagnation, uh, economic deprivation, economic struggle. And people wanted to blame that on the speculators. The reason why Keynes was so successful is because he combined our greatest fear, which is mass unemployment, right? Under the modern capitalist system, mass unemployment becomes the greatest fear, and our greatest resentment, the idle rich. So how many of you have seen like Downton Abbey? Even know of it? We'll have to go over this side because you're too young. It's a PBS show. But one of the things that's really fascinating about it is in the very first season of the show, the, uh, the main characters who are living in this, this landed estate uh, uh, called Downton Abbey, uh, the daughter, Mary, is, is considering you know, the bows who are like vying for her attentions. And the one she falls in love with is a, uh, a is he a, lo a lawyer or a doctor? I think he's a, he's a lawyer, right? Who, who, who has it, right? Lawyer, right? And you remember the family is like, oh. Lady Grantham is like, oh, Mary, a lawyer. Like, why would you do that? Like, you know, because he had to like, and same thing with a doctor. If you're like a doctor or a lawyer, you know, nowadays, like in my family, like, you know, my wife, my mother-in-law would have loved it if she was, you know. So when I was in graduate school getting a degree in economics, my mother-in-law told everyone in her neighborhood that I was getting a law degree. And Rosemary kept on telling her, Mom, no, he's getting a PhD. And she says, they don't understand that. They understand a law degree. So, so you know, we lied a little bit. Anyway, um, but the landed, the landed aristocracy didn't have to work. They just sat because they owned all this property and this land and they just lived off the resources. And one of the things that's fascinating about that story is the end of that, that era and the beginning of the modern world, which cuts into all of that. But Keynes caught that zeitgeist because these idle rich. So that's why when you learn in your macro classes about Keynes having this split between savings and investment, that's going to be the key thing that leads to all hell breaking loose. And it's because, right, what's going on is that these Idle rich are not making capital come alive for all the rest of you. So he, needs to, so he caught the zeitgeist by combining the greatest fear of capitalism with the greatest resentment of capitalism. And the book takes off like a bat out of hell. Hayek, who's like working on, you know, let's look at the manipulation of money and credit, how it impacts interest rates, and how those interest rates impact the decision makers of the entrepreneur. And so they've lowered the, you know, what happens to your ROI if you have a lower interest rate to borrow money? Come on, it goes up, right? Right, but what happens if that's a false signal? You invest in an entrepreneurial venture which you shouldn't have invested in because the real interest rate was much higher. So this is what Hayek was doing. Keynes is sitting there giving him a whole brand beautiful story. And so everyone's like, hey, Hayek. Well, that's the, he's an old fart when he was young. Right? And Keynes is all excited, who's actually old, but he's all exciting. So Hayek is like, what the hell? 10 years ago, you loved me. Now you hate me. Why? And here's his brilliant move. He does a two-prong move. You're not paying enough attention to institutions. So you didn't do that exercise over the present value calculation. If you did it, you'd understand you can't eradicate those institutions and still get coordination. And second of all, why is it that you don't know how to study those institutions? And that's epistemology. And he goes into a deep, deep dive in epistemology. This is actually like a very, very weird move. It's brilliant, but it's strange. Because he believed that they all were the sons and daughters of Saint Simon, who is this obscure French figure who's the opposite of the sciences humanist. All right, and believed in the idea that engineering was the way to go. So if you study anything about the French and around the time the French rationalists, that's where you got like those bunny, like, uh, you know, the king would come out and they'd have like the, the you know, the, um, the, sh the shrubs and everything, but they'd be cut to look like, you know, figures and all that stuff. This is all these kind of crazy people that did this because they think you could engineer everything, engineer all of society. And so Hayek argues that this is an abuse of reason. 
This is an abuse of reason. We're going to use, and so what Hayek adopted was the Jungian strategy, which is I'm going to use reason to whittle down the claims of reason. And so what he set out to do was to basically pull on the nostril hairs of the arrogance. Adam Smith did too. If you read Adam Smith, this is one of his enemies, is the arrogance. If you read Hume, he wanted to go after the arrogance. But then there's a whole other thing which said mankind, you know, and the easiest way of this to think about is if mankind is Prometheus unbound, everything is possible for man. So why would we put any constraints on mankind? So as an unconstrained, you know, Thomas Sowell uses this phraseology, the unconstrained uh, vision of man versus the constrained vision. Hayek and Hume and Smith, there are these constrained visions of man. Man is very imperfect. Man is in need of restraint. Uh, and whatnot. And so Hayek spends all this time talking about that both in the road to serfdom, which is more the institutional direction, and the counter-revolution of science, which is more the epistemological direction. And it's at this point that I argue in the book that Hayek's unique research program takes shape. And it's what I call in the book his epistemic institutionalism. And the easiest way to understand that, since you're all students or former students, is that different classrooms are more conducive to learning than other classrooms, right? Now, imagine if I took that metaphor and applied it to societies, right? So certain societies are more conducive to learning among the, the participants than others. And what we mean by learning in this case is opportunities for mutually beneficial exchange and opportunities for lower cost methods of, uh, uh, of production. And some are very stark, some are very cloudy, some the information's not there at all, right? And so it's the economy is a giant classroom. And we as participants, as entrepreneurs, are just students of that society. And we're reading all these different signals. And Hayek is getting us to try to recognize what would it be like if this was the, the, the kind of society we were operating in? What was it like this? So this, again, is not a, a reference any of you would, um, would buy into because you're too young. But some of you over here, I used to love this TV show called Sliders. It's a really, really bad sci-fi show, but I watch every single episode. Uh, what happened in it was you got caught in a, in a, it's a, at a period of time, so it's not overtime. Okay? So it's a cross section, not a time series. But what happens is you go into a wormhole and you show up in an alternative universe that is in your same time, but it's under different sets of rules. So it's not like Bill and Ted's excellent time machine, where you jump you know, back to, oh, this one, or you're just in the same time period. So one of my favorite ones is the main character who invented ended the way to travel. This is a guy named Quinn. And he goes into a parallel universe. And in that universe, if you solve math problems, you get rewarded the way Michael Jordan did for hitting three-point shots. And in fact, it's hilarious because they actually wear basketball uniforms and then like do the math problem and then like the thing goes, hey, hit a three pointer, you know, and they're like, yeah. And of course, Quinn is the most, you know, talented of all people, but he has to choose whether or not to go back into the wormhole to return back to his own home in which he's just a nerdy kid studying physics at the university. And he's like, <laughs> like, which one? I don't know. Maybe I'll stay, you know, like that. But the reason why I bring this up is because that's what we economists do all the time, is we slide between universes. And the thing that determines the different universes is the di different institutional environments we find ourselves operating within. So we find ourselves operating within a, a universe in which, say, a principal agency problem is not at all addressed. The rational behavior that individuals will engage in will be much different than if I find myself in a principal agency situation where we end up by having a market for corporate control and a market for managerial labor. All right, so when you think about things like any policy thing, so you guys, when you walk away from here, besides the entrepreneurship thing, if you think about any of this stuff, think about the environments within which you want to see a problem in the world that we have today. Like, so what's really goofy about the world? like around you today. One of them is healthcare, right? At the age of 26, you're not going to be able to be covered unless you have a job and you got benefits, right? Because your parents can no longer cover you, right? They're going to cut off and then you have it. Why do we have this weird healthcare system the way we have? Why is it tied to work? That's all because of rules that people adopted. It didn't used to be the case. You study American history prior to World War II and where did you get your healthcare from? 
a large percentage of people got their health care from their fraternal lodge or from their church, right? They're, they're mutual aid societies. That was the original HMO, was the lodge doctor. And everyone bought that. But why all of a sudden did health care get tied to work? The US government, after World War II, decided that firms shouldn't be able to compete on your wages because they were worried about this stagnation. So what they did was firms, in order to attract good talent, tied your health benefits to your work. That was a way to get that wages up without having to change your wages. Right? But in both cases, see, if, if I change that rule, I get a different outcome. So one of the standard ways to think about how you understand the social sciences is you freeze preferences, right? You vary institutions, and that allows you to explain the, the performance variation. You don't need a theory if good people do good things. You just say, oh, there's good people. Bad people do bad things. You don't need a theory for that. But if what you're going to do is you're going to freeze, treat everyone as the same, and then vary the institutions, you're going to study that variation in the institutions. One way to do that is conceptually slide between possible worlds. That's the slider idea, right? You're sliding between these possible worlds and then looking at the play of the incentives and capabilities there. That's what Hayek was trying to do in here. And the characteristics he was looking at become very stark in the idea that what makes the economic system operate from coordination is an institutional environment which respects private property, allows prices to guide production, to utilize its profits to lure actors into the market, and to use losses to discipline us. And so it's the property prices and profit and loss system that provides these epistemic properties that allow us to realize social gains, uh, the, the, the gains from social cooperation and the division of labor. That's liberalism. It's a system of property contract and consent. Okay? So what Hayek then argues is, okay, so people don't understand that liberal order. So if you read the first paragraph of Constitutional Liberty, he says each generation must take up the challenge of restating the principles in the language of their time. So remember, we just got done with what? The first half of the 20th century being these demented times. And we're continuing to be in all these tensions. And so Hayek gets to writing the Constitution of Liberty, and he wants to restate the liberal principles of justice. What would this society look like? And he does that through the Constitution of Liberty and in the three volumes of Law, Legislation, and Liberty, where he lays out his, his position. And so this is how you get a sort of a grapple on what Hayek is trying to do here is that it focus on the price system, on the institutions that make the price system operate, and then the consequences of those institutions for a, a society of free and responsible individuals. When he gets to here, it's a tension. This project, as I said, I don't develop much in the book, but the tension here is that our moral intuitions are at odds with the moral demands of the liberal society. Our moral intuitions are tribal. So I don't know how many here you know this, but Homo sapiens existed at the same time as ne uh, Neanderthals. How many know that? OK, a few of you know that. OK, what happened? OK, what? Among who? <laughs> Among the Homo sapiens, right. But you know, cooperation is good and bad. Right? So we cooperated. Humans, as opposed to our Neanderthal cousins, we have more evolved brains, so we're able to keep reciprocal accounts, which allows us to cooperate with one another. But we cooperated to then kill the other. We're like, like nature is red in tooth and claw, and we're like right there with it. All right? Now, we can survive nature because we can cooperate with one another. But in our previous existence, as we were first evolving, we grew up in small bands, and we distrusted the other. This is why liberalism is an emancipation doctrine. This is, what, this is why it's so important to understand this, uh, especially in our current context, when you're hearing all these like, weird-ass comments about globalization, anti-globalization, blah, blah, blah. Why is it that liberalism Liberalism tried to free us from the bonds of oppression 
That was the, the, the ideology, the bonds of oppression caused by the kings who were oppressing us, all right? But also free us from what? Free us from the bonds of slavery, free us from the bonds of poverty, right? How do you get the freedom from the bonds of poverty? Through trade, through wealth creation. And so what liberalism demanded was cosmopolitanism. The goal was the Kantian goal of strangers nowhere in this world. So when Hayek uses the word catalaxy, it's a fancy Greek word, it means exchange. And in, the, and, and in the Greek letters, if you look at it, it looks like two people shaking a handshake, having a handshake. And the reason was because the term also means turning a stranger into friendship. Trade was the great civilizer, right? This is the Voltaire quote. Right? The Jew, the Gentile, and the Muslim may war with one another, but when they go into the market, they just exchange. And the heathen is, uh, is limited only to that who doesn't pay his bills. Right? That's the liberal project. The liberal project is cosmopolitanism. Cosmopolitanism grounded in compassion. So as you're watching people move from horrible situations, you don't say, oh my God, don't come here. You welcome them with open arms. Right? You know, you don't sit there and say, oh, no, no, no. You welcome them with open arms. That message, by the way, doesn't fit with our moral intuitions. So as a result, our moral intuitions are at odds with the moral demands of the great society. But the great society delivers for us all this wealth. Look at the meal that you ate today. It's not indigenous to Virginia. <laughs> okay? Right? And yet you benefited from it tremendously, right? So this is the, this is the key, key insight of what Hayek is trying to get at and the promise of that. And so it's a huge mistake if people don't explain the promise of what liberalism tried to do. And capitalism is just the market system within liberalism. Capitalism, in terms of capitalism as in the interest of capital, that's the anti-liberalism. That's what Adam Smith called mercantilism. And it's the sophistry of the businessmen who line up with the state in order to protect the privilege of the few against the, the, uh, uh, to, and to penalize the many. The whole point of liberalism was to attack privileges. That's why Hayek titles his book Law, Legislation, and Liberty is because he's going after legislation because the root of legislation is in privileges, the granting of privileges to people. And he wants to abolish those privileges. All right, so what was the Hayekian research program? All right, the argument I try to make is that Hayek was compelled to develop uh, deeper into the institutional framework within which commercial society and non-commercial life takes place. And in addition to the structure of incentives that the human actors face in making decisions, but the epistemic properties of these alternative institutional environments. So the book goes through the following thing. Um, which is, these are just the, the chapters, and uh, kind of just what I just talked about, as you can see, um, I go through here. For those of you who are studying economics, probably the, the most important chapter, I, I, this is not working, or I can't get it to work, it's user failure, is probably chapter four and probably chapter seven. Uh, chapter four is the nature of the price system and the playing out of the property prices and profit and loss. And chapter seven is an evolution development of the institutional economics. Let me step back for a second, which I didn't say before, which is one of the really cool things about Hayek, is that Hayek was educated in an institutional environment in which a PhD in economics was in a law school. Right? Uh, so it wasn't separate, it was in a law school, which meant that all of them were trained in law, political science. Hayek's first PhD is actually in political science. Second PhD is in economics. Uh, Germans have to have two PhDs, okay? It's the way that they do their system. Um, but that's, that's true for Mises, that's true for Schumpeter, it's true for, you know, if you read Joseph Schumpeter, he was also educated in the same system. Um, and so they always did institutional economics because the institutions were a big part of their idea. They didn't think that institutions needed to be stressed because we all took institutions for granted, because that's what we study. And then they came into the Anglo-Saxon environment or the Anglo world, not the Anglo-Saxon, but the Anglo world of economics, and institutions were pushed aside, all right? Um, and so they had to rediscover them. And one of the big things of the post 
Second World War II period of economics is the rediscovery of institutions in economics. It's the reason why Ronald Coase wins a Nobel Prize. It's the reason why my teacher James Buchanan wins a Nobel Prize. It's the reason why Doug North wins a Nobel Prize. Right? It's the reason why Eleanor Ostrom, the first and to this day only woman to win the Nobel Prize. It's this institutional revolution in economics. These guys were the first ones there because they already were there. And so that's why the inspiration. The very last public talk that Eleanor Ostrom gave was her Hayek lecture. Um, and that's important. Uh, you know, People that are, are unfortunately struck with pancreatic cancer don't have to do certain things, and yet she chose to make sure that she gave that talk. All right, so what else do I do in the book? Uh, there's a full citation study in the book. So you can go in the back of the book and you can look at the impact that Hayek has had in his career over his uh, economics. I'm trying to make an argument that Hayek should be impacting the DNA of economists. Um, and so I want to try to show that aspect of things. Um, the impact of the use of knowledge, which is his most famous article. It's one of the top 20 articles in the history of the publication of the American Economic Review. Um, his own intellectual tree. Um, and then his professional timeline um, is all in there. It's all in the back of the book. But one of the coolest things, which you can be part of, let me go over here because you guys are old. <laughs> you guys can be part of, which is this living bibliography of Hayek. It's an online resource because it was so big that we couldn't put it in the back of the book. So we put it online. And it's constantly evolving depending on what you do. So like if you write an article, it gets added to that. If you, you know, do another study that's related to it, it gets added to it. So it's a living project, and it's actually a constantly evolving project that will go in a variety of different directions, depending on who? You. Hayek's dead. But Hayekianism need not be dead. It's in your hands, or potentially in your hands. And you can then write the works that will, in fact, be part of that. And that's part of the spirit of what I wanted to try to do in the book. So what's the continuing relevance of Hayek? Again, too much inside the weeds in some sense. But what I want to say to my fellow economists is, shame on you. You gave up the most important golden key of economic reasoning, which is called price theory, for this false god that you believe called optimization theory. And I want to smack you in the heads with it. And so that's what I'm doing in the book. Uh, we have to recapture uh, price theory. Second, that in order to do that, we have to actually develop a genuine institutional economics, an economics which takes into account the political, the legal, and social environment within which commercial activity exists, and to study that. And understand, by the way, how difficult that is in terms of finding the right controls when doing scientific work. Understand, no one's saying this is easy. It's a great apocryphal story, slightly not apocryphal maybe, that uh, Mises was talking once about what it takes to be an economist. And he says, you know, to be a great economist, you must be a historian, a mathematician, a you know, political theorist, you know, a philosopher, you know, blah, 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 and like that. And Larry Moss, who was a young kid at the time, raised his hand and said, Professor Mises, that is really impossible for anyone to do. And Mises says, no one told you to be an economist. <laughs> uh, so you know, to do economics, you have to uh, work at this intersection of all these different disciplines, as Baldy Harper understood, to understand the sciences humanus. And then finally, I think, as I was trying to hint at before, this reconstruction of the liberal project. For this day and age, with the person that is currently at the top, whatever your politics are, his rhetoric is not cosmopolitan, all right? His rhetoric is demeaning. And we should have a better public rhetoric. Even if, remember, I'm critical of the progressive elites as well, right? So the smugness of the progressive elites, I agree, needs to be called into challenge. But you can call it into challenge in a much more civil way and you can also promise a much more cosmopolitan world than we have. This is not the time to be bashful in the defense of cosmopolitan and liberal values. This is the time to actually be stressing even more 
that we are one another's equal, that we treat individuals with dignity and respect, whoever we meet. When we disagree with people, that's perfectly fine. You can disagree with people, but you have to treat them with dignity and respect. And it's, it's time that we understand that and that we understand, again, how you do that institutionally is to protect people and their persons, right? To give them the idea to, pro to live in caring communities, to prosper in market economies, um, and, and to live lives as they see their projects being fulfilled. So how do you see that kind of liberal vision? I think it's very important, this is now more towards the IHS people, to communicate that message as loudly as you possibly can and as repeatedly as you can to the audiences that you reach in your college classrooms. All right, and this is about the liberal society, that is the, and the sciences humanus is the best method by which to study the liberal society. So the IHS mission, going from Baldy Harper all the way up to Emily Chamley Wright, should be reaffirmed every single day in the way that you go to work. And at the core of that was Hayek. By the way, this picture is actually from IHS. Uh, it's uh, Hayek in the 1970s. Uh, sitting, uh, you know, uh, talking to a bunch of graduate students. I envision, I have no idea if this is true, but uh, supposedly the graduate students that were around him at the time were attacking him for being an old fuddy-duddy and not understanding the benefits of radical liberalism. Uh, I won't use the other words that are associated with that at the moment, but, uh, and he said supposedly that if I was a young man, I would agree with you, but I'm too old and so I stick with these things. So, but I think you guys think about what it is to be a radical liberal and a cosmopolitan in this day and age. Because we ourselves live in our demented times. And we have to have a quest for exact thinking in these demented times. And so we need to work hard for that. So anyway, thank you very much. I will.